Lehi's sons and Zoram marry Ishmael's daughters. The Lord gives the people the Leahona, with which he guides them through the wilderness according to their faith and diligence. Nephi's bow breaks, making it difficult to hunt for food. Everyone murmurs except Nephi, who makes a new bow, asks Lehi where to go for food, and brings food to the people. Nephi demonstrates unwavering faith by obeying the Lord's command to build a ship. Laman, Lemuel, the sons of Ishmael and their wives, join in rebellion on the ship. Laman and Lemuel bind Nephi, who demonstrates courage and gratitude despite this trial. The Lord sends a great tempest. Laman and Lemuel loose Nephi, who guides the ship to the promised land. Ishmael, we're filled with gratitude for your faith for joining us on this difficult journey. Your faith is a great gift. My sons and now daughters, we have fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord which have been given unto us. We have been blessed of the Lord. You are indeed the hope of Israel, which is why, as I offer a few thoughts, I pray that the Holy Ghost will deliver the exact message you need to hear. Prior to our marriage, I was a professor of marriage and family therapy for more than 25 years. I learned what can heal even ravaged marriages and what can wreck others almost overnight. Truth number one, truths about love and marriage are brought to you by the Holy Ghost from our Heavenly Father. He decreed marriage to be an irreplaceable component of His plan of happiness. The Spirit is the messenger of these truths. I urge you to seek to understand them. By contrast, lies about love and marriage originate with and are perpetuated by Satan and his servants. The adversary rejoices every time he persuades a victim to embrace anything that defiles or degrades love and marriage. Truth number two, personal purity is the key to true love. The more pure your thoughts and feelings, your words and actions, the greater your capacity to give and receive true love. Trust me on this. Every time you pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father in prayer and then listen, every time you study the scriptures seeking answers to the questions of your heart, every time you avoid anything that would wound your spirit, such as pornography, Every time you worship in the temple, every time you find an ancestor's ordinance qualifying information, you are choosing to increase your personal purity. Truth number three, as an important part of the expression of their love, the Lord wants a husband and wife to partake of the wonders and joys of marital intimacy. Marital intimacy is ordained by God. It is commanded and commended by Him because it draws a husband and wife closer together and closer to the Lord. True marital intimacy involves the whole soul of each spouse. It is the uniting of the body and the spirit of the husband with the body and the spirit of his wife. To truth number four, for true marital intimacy, the Holy Ghost needs to be involved. It is simply not possible to have the kind of intimate experiences outside of marriage that you can have within because the Spirit will not be present. Elder Parley P. Pratt taught that the Holy Ghost has the ability to increase, enlarge, expand, and purify all the natural passions and affections. Just imagine, He can purify your feelings. Therefore, anything that invites the Spirit into your life and into the life of your spouse and your marriage will increase your ability to experience marital intimacy. It really is as simple and as profound as that. Elder David A. Bedner of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the purpose of the Liahona and compared it to the Holy Spirit in our day. The Liahona was prepared by the Lord and given to Lehi and his family after they left Jerusalem and were traveling in the wilderness. This compass or director pointed the way that Lehi and his caravan should go, even a straight course to the promised land. 
The pointers in the Liahana operated according to the faith and diligence and heed of the travelers and failed to work when family members were contentious, rude, slothful, or forgetful. Of the Lord spake unto me by night. He commanded me to take our journey into the wilderness. In 1869, President George A. Smith, who was a counselor to President Brigham Young, spoke of how the saints came to settle in the Salt Lake Valley. The question is frequently asked How did you ever find this place? I answer We were led to it by the inspiration of God. President Young had a vision of Joseph Smith who showed him the mountain that we now call Ensign Peak. Joseph said, build there and you will prosper and have peace. None among them had ever been in the country or knew anything about it. However, they traveled under the direction of President Young until they reached this valley. In January 1847, President Brigham Young had a dream in which he discussed with the Prophet Joseph Smith the best way to help the saints cross the plains. Three days later, he presented to the church the revelation now contained in section 136 of the Doctrine and Covenants. As a visionary leader, he directed, loved, inspired, demanded, planned, and rebuked. With authority and revelation from God, Brigham Young led the saints westward. The courage and humor with which he faced the daunting trials of persecution and relocation served as an anchor for the weary yet faithful saints. Now what will we do? Elder Neil A. Maxwell shared how great lessons often come after difficulties. Nephi's broken bow doubtless brought to him some irritation, but not immobilizing bitterness. After all, he was just trying to feed the extended family, so why should he have to contend as well with a broken bow? Yet out of that episode came a great teaching moment. Irritation often precedes instruction. Many of the trials and hardships we encounter in life are severe and appear to have lasting consequences. Each of us will experience some of these during the vicissitudes of life. This life is not always easy, nor was it meant to be. It is a time of testing and proving. The challenges we face today are in their own way comparable to challenges of the past. The recent economic crisis has caused significant concern throughout the world. Employment and financial problems are not unusual. Many people have physical and mental health challenges. Others deal with marital problems or wayward children. Some have lost loved ones. Addictions and inappropriate or harmful propensities cause heartache. Whatever the source of the trials, they cause significant pain and suffering for individuals and those who love them. We are aware that many who are listening to this conference are experiencing trials and hardships of such intensity that the underlying feeling in their hearts as they approach our Father in Heaven in prayer is, hope you know. I'm having a hard time. Think of the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane during the atonement process, suffering agony so great that He bled from every pore. His cry to His Father included the word Abba, 
This might be interpreted as the cry of a son who is in distress to his father. O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. I testify that the atonement of Jesus Christ covers all of the trials and hardships that any of us will encounter in this life. At times when we may feel to say, hope you know, I had a hard time, we can be assured that He is there and we are safe in His loving arms. When our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, was asked on his birthday this past August what would be the ideal gift that members worldwide could give him, he said without a moment's hesitation, find someone who is having a hard time and do something for them. I, with you, am eternally grateful to Jesus Christ, the Rescuer of mankind. I bear witness that He is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. What is that fool doing? Father, whither shall I go to obtain food? My son, thank you for your faith. In 1968, a marathon runner by the name of John Stephen Aquari represented Tanzania in an international competition. A little over an hour after the winner had crossed the finish line, John Stephen Aquari approached the stadium, the last man to complete the journey. Though suffering from fatigue, leg cramps, dehydration, disorientation, a voice called from, from within to go on, so he went on. Afterwards it was written, Today we have seen a young African runner who symbolizes the finest in human spirit, a performance that gives meaning to the word courage. For some, the only reward is a personal one. There are no medals, only the knowledge that they finished what they set out to do. When asked why he had completed a race he could never win, Aquarius replied, My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me to finish the race. He knew who he was, an athlete representing the country of Tanzania. He knew his purpose, to finish the race. He knew that he had to endure to the end and finish so that he could honor honorably return home to Tanzania. Our mission in life is much the same. We were not sent by Father in Heaven just to be born. We were sent to endure and to return home to Him with honor. I have carefully considered all of the reasons President Benson has given for studying the Book of Mormon. One reason stands out above all the rest. I believe that it was the neglect, the treating lightly of this subject that brought the early church under condemnation. I believe it is the neglect of this subject that has continued the condemnation in our own day. Though supremely important, this subject is so simple that it is easy for us to neglect it in favor of other things. The subject I believe we have neglected is the Book of Mormon's witness of the divinity and mission of Jesus Christ and our covenant relationship to Him. The Book of Mormon is Christ-centered. That is its essential feature, and that is the reason we are commanded to study it continually. We must use the Book of Mormon to bring us to Christ.
but is thy will, Lord. Thou shalt construct a ship, after the manner which I shall show thee, that I may carry thy people across these waters. Whither shall I go, that I may find ore to molten, that I may make tools to construct the ship after the manner which thou hast shown unto me? Nephi's response to the Lord's command to build a ship gives us insight into his remarkable faith. Other prophets have also been overwhelmed at times by tasks commanded by the Lord. Moses felt inadequate when called to lead the children of Israel. Enoch felt he was slow of speech and wondered why the Lord called him. Nephi might have been overwhelmed with the thought of building an ocean going vessel. Instead, his response displayed great faith, Whither shall I go that I may find or to molten, that I may make tools to construct the ship? Nephi's confidence did not likely come from any previous shipbuilding experience. Rather, his confidence stemmed from tremendous faith in God. It's a feeling that you cannot deny. It's something that sticks with you. Even if you have doubts about it, it sticks with you. For everybody it's a bit different, but you can have a thought come to your mind, a moment of clarity, a feeling in your heart. I'll feel strong confirmation telling me that what I'm doing is a good thing or what I'm deciding to do is the right thing to do. The Holy Ghost helps communicate. It can comfort, it can teach us, it speaks to us in a way that we understand it. I feel the surety in, in the very center of my being. I feel faith and I feel confidence. It's almost like a feeling. It comes different to everyone. But for me, it's always a feeling. I just know, I feel that it's right. I've had some, some lows experienced in my life where I felt very alone. And um, I think the only thing that kept me from giving up completely on life was that Holy Ghost saying, hey, it wasn't a loud voice, it was a quiet voice. And it would say, hey, Heavenly Father loves you. It's gonna be okay. When I feel the Holy Spirit, it's real to me to the point where it pushes me to, to become a better version of myself. To always evaluate myself and to see all my weaknesses and to work on them. If you listen and you just trust, I think it's just all about really trusting with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, and just knowing that Heavenly Father is in control, and that through the Holy Spirit, you can have access to what you need. Elder Joseph B. Worthlin, 1917 to 2008, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that spiritual insensitivity isn't just a problem for those with serious sin. I fear that some members of the Lord's Church live far beneath our privileges with regard to the gift of the Holy Ghost. Some are distracted by the things of the world that block out the influence of the Holy Ghost, preventing them from recognizing spiritual promptings. This is a noisy and busy world that we live in. Remember that being busy is not necessarily being spiritual. If we are not careful, the things of this world can crowd out the things of the Spirit. Some are spiritually deadened and past feeling because of their choices to commit sin. Others simply hover in spiritual complacency with no desire to rise above themselves and commune with the infinite. If they would open their hearts to the refining influence of this unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost, a glorious new spiritual dimension would come to light. Their eyes would gaze upon a vista scarcely imaginable. They could know for themselves things of the spirit that are choice, precious, and capable of enlarging the soul, expanding the mind, and filling the heart with inexpressible joy. 
We share an enormous responsibility to be who the Lord wants us to be and to do what He wants us to do. We are part of a great movement, the gathering of scattered Israel. I speak of this doctrine today because of its unique importance in God's eternal plan. Anciently, the Lord blessed Father Abraham with a promise to make his posterity a chosen people. References to this covenant occur throughout the scriptures. The Book of Mormon teaches that this Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled only in these latter days. It also emphasizes that we are among the covenant people of the Lord. Ours is the privilege to participate personally in the fulfillment of these promises. What an exciting time to live! As descendants of Abraham, the tribes of ancient Israel had access to priesthood authority and blessings of the gospel, but eventually the people rebelled. They killed the prophets and were punished by the Lord. Ten tribes were carried captive into Assyria. From there, they became lost to the records of mankind. Obviously, the ten tribes are not lost to the Lord. Two remaining tribes continued a short time and then, because of their rebellion, were taken captive into Babylon. When they returned, they were favored of the Lord, but again, they honored him not. They rejected and vilified him. A loving but grieving father vowed, I will scatter you among the heathen. And that he did into all nations. God's promise for the gathering of scattered Israel was equally emphatic. Isaiah, for example, foresaw that in the latter days the Lord would send swift messengers to these people who were so scattered and peeled. This promise of the gathering, woven all through the fabric of the scriptures, will be fulfilled just as surely as were the prophecies of the scattering of Israel. Isaiah's writings testify that Jesus Christ is the only true source of hope for men and women living in a fallen world. Consequently, Nephi cited hundreds of verses Isaiah wrote that testify of the Savior. One scholar noted that, of the 425 separate verses of Isaiah which are quoted in the Book of Mormon, 391 say something about the attributes or mission of Jesus Christ. Moreover, Nephi recognized that Isaiah's testimony was similar to his own, as both had seen the Lord. Nephi explained. And now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children, for he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. At a time when persecution intensified toward the newly organized church, the Lord said to Joseph Smith and Olivet Cowdery, Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many. But endure them, for lo, I am with thee, even unto the end of thy days. Tribulation, afflictions, and trials will constantly be, be with us in our sojourn here in the segment of eternity, just as the Savior said. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Therefore, the great challenge in this earthly life is not to determine how to escape the afflictions and problems, but rather to carefully prepare ourselves to meet them. I say prepare ourselves because it demands persistent effort, develop patience as a personal attribute. In practicing patience, one comes to understand it and acquire it. We must have patience in order to withstand pain and grief without complaint or discouragement, which detract from the spirit. It's necessary to have patience in the face of tribulation and persecution for the cause of truth, which sets an example because the manner in which we bear our cross will be an influence to others.
to help lighten the load. Patients must be our constant companion during the journey which carries us toward the great goal, continuing patient until we are, ye are perfected, the counsel the Lord gave to the elders of the church. It should be made clear that we are not talking here about passive patience, which waits only for the passing of time to heal or resolve things which happen to us, but rather a patience that is active, which makes things happen. Such was the patient Paul described in his epistle to the Romans when he used the words, be patient, continuance in well-doing. I think the restoration of the priesthood shows the love our Father in Heaven has for us. When we use the priesthood properly, we are furthering God's work, we're blessing other people, we're blessing our families. The priesthood has blessed my life in all aspects of my life as a daughter and a sister and a mother and a wife. To know that you can always be that close uh, to the Savior just brings heaven into your home. The scriptures are rich in references to the second coming, an event eagerly awaited by the righteous and dreaded or denied by the wicked. The faithful of all ages have pondered the sequence and meaning of the many events prophesied to precede and follow this hinge point of history. Four matters are indisputable to Latter-day Saints. One, the Savior will return to the earth in power and great glory to reign personally during a millennium of righteousness and peace. Two, at the time of his coming, there will be a destruction of the wicked and a resurrection of the righteous. Three, no one knows the time of his coming, but four, the faithful are taught to study the signs of it and to be prepared for it. While we are powerless to alter the fact of the second coming and unable to know its exact time, we can accelerate our own preparation and try to influence the preparation of those around us. We are living in the prophesied time when peace shall be taken from the earth and when all things shall be in commotion and men's hearts shall fail them. There are many temporal causes of commotion, including wars and natural disasters, but an even greater cause of current commotion is spiritual. Evil that used to be localized and covered like a boil is now legalized and paraded like a banner. The most fundamental roots and bulwarks of civilization are questioned or attacked. Nations disavow their religious heritage. Not surprisingly, many of our youth and adults are caught up in pornography, pagan piercing of body parts, self-serving pleasure pursuits, dishonest behavior, revealing attire, foul language, and degrading sexual indulgence. We are surrounded by challenges on all sides, but with faith in God, we trust the blessings He has promised those who keep His commandments. We have faith in the future, and we are preparing for that future. To borrow a metaphor from the familiar world of athletic competitions, we do not know when this game will end and we do not know the final score. But we do know that when the game finally ends, our team wins. This group provides videos to help encourage gospel study. This is not an official church site. The materials used are all provided by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, and those videos and images used under license through a subscription to CyberLink PowerDirector, unless otherwise noted.